fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. We're back after that great word from our sponsor. <laughs> And, uh, and at this time now, we're joining us is uh, Lisa Freeman. And we're going to be talking about the parole system and how she's found it and her book, She Won't Be Silenced. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, sit with us, Lisa. Oh, thank you for having me. Okay. Now, Lisa, before we get in, into the details, um, what drove you to write this book? Um, for, for me, it was, I wanted to have a permanent record of, um, not only of my dad's murder, which is what the media focuses on, but uh, a record of his life as well. And I wanted to document my struggles and what I have gone through trying to find some sort of justice within our, our justice system here, um, the correctional services system and the parole board system. Now, when you when you so um, try to, to make a conversation and a dialogue around what's wrong, what I'm seeing, what's wrong, and uh, you know, shine a spotlight on the system and help other people, you know, who have to go through the same thing, if if you know, help them and make their path a little bit easier. So now let's 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 maybe review a little bit about the story. What got you? Okay. Into um, dealing with parole and, and and the justice system. So what what was the background? Um, in 1991, in February 1991, uh, my dad was taking care of some rooming houses um, here where I live, um, for a friend of his that was at that time vacationing in Florida for the winter. Um, a drifter by the name of Cherry Porter previously lived in the house a few months before. And he came back to Ontario looking for his girlfriend. Um, the owner of the house knew that they were having a very um, abusive relationship and moved her away. So this drifter comes back looking for the girlfriend, um, comes across my dad, who's there taking care of the place, uh, filling in for the owner. And he's asking him where she is and... Uh, my dad, either he knew and didn't tell him or just really didn't know that uh, where her new location was. And uh, he, he ended up killing him simply because he didn't have the information he was looking for. Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So, so now what was his sentence for, for the murder? Uh, his sentence, um, the trial was in the summer of 1992, and he pled the old charge of not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, but the jury found him guilty, and he was sentenced to life in prison with no parole for 25 years. Mm. Okay, so now we're up to the date where um, he's going up for parole. So how, how, what, what's the very first thing that happens to someone in your position um, when um, the, the person convicted of the crime um, goes up for parole are you notified like how, how does that go um well the very first thing that happened um after the trial was that we were given a certificate of conviction that said just that life in prison no parole for 25 years so you know you do the math and it's right there that would be 2016 so in 2011 i'm thinking okay i've got five years to uh prepare myself for something like this because for the 20 years in between the trial and, uh, you know, the five-year prep time that I was giving myself, you know, I didn't really talk about this to anybody. So I thought, you know, I need to make some contact with people. We had no idea 
where this man was, where he was in prison. We just knew it was Kingston. We didn't know anything else about it. Um, you know, what his life was, what, you know, what he did day to day. We had no information. So in 2011, I'm thinking, okay, I need, I need some prep time. Um, I made some phone calls, and it turned out I had to register as a victim with the Pro Board of Canada. And I did so and uh, said, you know, you know, I, I know I'm five years too early. I said, no, that's fine. Three months later, I get a letter in the mail from the parole board saying that I could go to Kingston, Ontario to do a victim impact statement because this offender was eligible for parole. And I said, no, no, you've got the mass bomb. You're five years too early. And I said, it's supposed to be 2016. It's only 2011. And they said, well, no, that's, that's just what the certificate says. That's not the reality of parole in this country. It actually starts much sooner. And I'm like, what? And they're like, well, they're eligible for different kinds of parole before mm -hmm. that parole mark. So here I am, five years before I thought I ever needed to be, thinking about parole. And it was escorted temporary absences. It was uh, day parole, um, community service work, well in advance of that mark. So I'm caught off guard um, just by the fact that it's, it's five years too early for me. And uh, so that's where it all started. That, that's my introduction into the corrections and the parole system of Canada, that the certificate that we had all those years was actually worth nothing because, you know, that's what we looked at. We, we thought of it as, it, you know, it, it's actually a false comfort, not only deceptive, but it was a false comfort, um, thinking we had 25 years before we had to deal with any kind of parole. But in reality, it was 20, 20 to 21 years before we had to think about it. Wow. What kind of, um, yeah. what were they, what was he trying to get, what kind of parole was he trying to get at that time, at the, at the early mark? Uh, es yeah, yeah, escorted temporary absences from the prison um, for rehabilitation purposes. Uh, turned out to be community service work and stays in halfway houses as well. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Did, did, so now does that, does that scare you or does it worry you? It worries me a lot for um, for a few reasons. First of all, it's it's well before not just myself and my family ever thought, but well before the public ever thinks, because that's the sentence here. And it's often repeated, um, you know, life in prison, no parole for 25 years. But in reality, uh, these dangerous criminals are out on the street doing, you know, community service work. They're out on day passes. They're in halfway houses well before the public ever even realizes that they're out there. Um, it's just happenstance that the public does find out because usually it's, it's you know, they don't advertise it that people are out early. Um, it's just by happenstance that I'm a registered victim with the parole board that I'm finding out at all. And, I, and I'm glad that I did register what I did because if I would have waited until 2016, all these things would have happened and I wouldn't have known about it, which is not right. Now, so, so now, what's what's the process that you have to go through, um, in a with a parole board? Like, what what is it you're required to do? Register. They want you to register as a victim of crime. And when I was first told I had to register as a victim, um, I said I'm not registering as a victim because I've never considered myself a victim. My dad's a victim. Um, I'm the secondary victim, really, as a family member. Um, and with the trial in 1992, we had no support as a family because at that time in Canada, there were no victim services. There was no um, dedicated professionals to help people like us. And um, we weren't allowed to do a victim impact statement in court. So we had nobody to advocate for us. And um, it was just my older sister and I who went to the trial every day. And uh, we had asked if we could do a victim impact statement, and we were told by the lead prosecutor at the time that you couldn't, that we couldn't, because it would have no effect on anything, um, that it wouldn't make any difference to what the judge had said or whatever sentence he would come down with. But interestingly enough, Terry Porter, so the man who killed my dad, um, was allowed to take the stand one last time to say what he wanted to say, and he said he wasn't sorry for what he did. He was just sorry that he got caught. So fast forward 20 years, I'm asked to be, I'm, I'm being asked to register as a victim. Um, I said there was no victim services or any advocates, but there was one detective 
who was very, very good to my sister and I. And after the trial, he took me aside and he said, um, you know, it's okay to be angry at what you've seen and what you've heard, but don't be bitter. Because if you become bitter, then Terry Porter has another victim. And I never forgot those words. So you fast forward 20 years when I'm being asked to, you know, register as a victim. I didn't like that a lot at, at all because in my mind, I wasn't a victim. So that's the first stage. You register as a victim and then um, I always say it's like the floodgates open. Um, everything I was wondering for the 20 years is suddenly being sent to me. Um, reports on his institutional behavior, what courses he's taken, um, how he how he has done in those courses, um, if he's taken anger management, if he's had any um, disciplinary measures taken in prison. All those things I was wondering are suddenly in my mailbox, and uh, it was information overload because, um, as I said, I didn't have anything for two decades, mm-hmm. and then there it is back in front of me again um, five years before I thought I would ever need to deal with it. So it was a lot of um, a lot of adjusting to get back into that frame of mind and to process it all. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing you do is you register as a victim, um, and then you just go through the system. They notify you um, when hearings are coming up and when you can do an impact statement. Um, you know, there's a whole website and lots of literature um, to guide you through the, through the process. But the reality of dealing within the system differs greatly from what Correctional Services and the Pro Board presents to people. Um, it's not, it's not what you're reading. It doesn't, the experience doesn't match the description of what it, what they tell you it will be like. So, so what exactly, um, is the difference? Like what, what are you saying that they portray and then what reality is? What are Um, the key points? Well, they put out there, you know, how important it is to do a victim impact statement, which it is. And really that's your only opportunity to say what you need to say, um, to, to say how this has impacted your life, and not only just your life, but the, the other people in your family. Um, so, you know, you write these statements, but they have the opportunity to redact it. If they don't like what you've written, they send it back for you to change. And the Pro Board of Canada and Correctional Services Canada have a whole list of do and do not uh, suggestions for impact statements. And, again, I disagree with that because... It's such an offender-driven uh, system shouldn't be telling victims of crime what to write. And it comes down to, um, you know, take, it, you know, make your impact statement about 10 minutes. Well, why would they put a limit on something like this? I had two decades of what I felt I needed to say, um, and they shouldn't be, you know, watching the clock while I'm saying it. Um, it came down to little things like I wanted to stand to read my impact statement. And they said, no, you need to sit down and read it. And uh, I challenged them. And in the end, they let me stand to read it because nobody sits down to read a statement. Um, I wanted to read it last. So the panelists had my words and, and my thoughts and my feelings in their minds when they went off to make their decisions. They said, no, you have to read it first because the offender has the last word. And uh, at the end of all that, they, they gave a little bit and let me read second to last, so before the offender. So they're pr- putting it out there that you've got all these choices. You've got, you know, it's your impact statement, your value to this um, process. But when it comes right down to it, it is a very offender-driven um, system. And I had um, people at Corrections and the Pool Board remind me several times that it's not my hearing. And I would say, well, it is my hearing. I'm here speaking, you know, for my dad, speaking for my family. I need to play a part in this somewhere and not just the little role that you're giving me. And um, with, you know, being persistent, I did get my way for quite a few things. But at the same time, I shouldn't have to, it shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be so many hoops that I have to jump through just to read an impact statement that how I wanted to read it and what I felt should be in it. Mm. So you're yeah. you're in essence feeling like um, the parole board's not really there for the victim. No, no, not at all. It's not at all. It's very offender driven. Um, and as the parole process has unfolded, 
since 2011, right up until today, um, every every interaction I have with them, that drives that home even more. Um, he waived, for example, Terry Porter waived his right to full parole in 2016. And um, I had a letter come in the mail saying he waived his right to parole in 2016. And the next scheduled parole hearing is December of 2020. And I thought, okay, that gives me four years, so I don't have to think about this anymore. But the very next sentence in the letter said that, um, you know, the next scheduled date is 2020 unless he chooses to have it earlier. And I thought, well, why would you do that? Why would you put that the next date is 2020 unless the offender decides to have it sooner? That doesn't make sense to me. Um, If you miss a bus, you don't get to dial up a bus to come by. You have to wait till the next one. So, as I said, through the years, everything that, I, that I've learned, everything that I've, you know, come across, it just reinforces that, that first thought that in my head, this is so offender-driven. And I think anybody who navigates through this system would agree with me. And the public as well, um, from what they will see, will, will agree that it is offender-driven. Yeah. I've talked... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I've talked to uh, a number of people in the same position as you, and all of them echo what you've said to me, especially what stands out to me is that uh, the uh, offender has the last word. That, yes, uh, yes. that That's really shocking that, you know, in this day and age, we, yes. we allow this person who has uh, essentially ruined your life to have the last yes. word. Exactly. Um, and it even extends to the panel hearing that I attended in 2012 in Kingston, Ontario. Um, as I said, I had 20 years of not speaking about it to anyone. The older sister who came with me, um, attended the trial every day with me, had since passed away. So, um, you know, I went on my own, and I, I did have my husband with me, but I, you know, I was there representing my family by myself. And during the panel hearing, um, there was three panelists, and one of them introduced me twice by full name in front of this man who killed my dad. And when I came back home and let, you know, the dust settle and, and everything, you know, thinking about everything, you know, that, that really bothered me. That really bothered me that they thought that that was an okay thing to do. And I went through the, the chain of command, uh, contacting people in corrections and the full board complaining about that. And I was told repeatedly that it's his right to know who's complaining about him. And I thought, well, that's wrong. That fundamentally is wrong, that they feel that they can just say my name, introduce me like I'm at some sort of cocktail party um, at the beginning and at the end of this panel hearing uh, with the man who asked my father to death sitting 10 feet away from me. That was completely and totally wrong, and they didn't own it. It was like, well, it's his hearing. It's his right to know who's complaining about him. Um, and that's basically it, and completely wrong, completely wrong, and re-traumatizing, re-traumatizing, re-victimizing, um, you know, very hard to deal with that. So it's almost like they're there to um, defend and help the, the, the convict. Of course, yes, it is exactly it, because if they're able to say my name and introduce me twice in front of this man, but yet at the same time, every letter I get from corrections, every piece of information I get from the parole board, on the top of the letter is a confidentiality banner that states, I'm not allowed to talk about what's in there. I'm not allowed to take it to the media. I'm not allowed to post it online. But yet they're able to impose that on me to basically gag me from speaking, but yet they're able to tell this offender um, my name and say it in front of him. Like, to me, that was just, okay, at that point, it's like, all right, you know, the gloves are off. Um, I do understand uh, data confidentiality. I completely understand that, but not in this situation. Uh, for me, it was like, if you, can, if you think it's okay to, to breach my privacy, by what you did in an environment that I should have felt I could be um, protected in, then I'm going to breach your confidentiality banner, and I will speak to the media, and I will post online what you're telling me, because the public has the right to know how you operate. And so that's what I've been doing um, over the last, 
you know, X amount of years mm. since that time. How have they responded toward that? Like, it has corrections come um, <laughs> They're not happy about it. Um, I had posted online for my Justice for Dad page um, on Facebook that I had a letter from Corrections saying that Terry Porter was doing community service work in the Kingston and Gamanoque area, um, but his but his past history was protected from not only the public, but the people that he was working alongside of. And I didn't think that was right. And that went um, in the Toronto Sun as well. And I was contacted, Corrections called me, I was at work and I took the phone call saying I needed to take that down because it was a security breach and um, it was putting the institution at risk and it was putting the public at risk and it was putting the offender at risk. And my response was, that's unfortunate. I'm not taking it down. And uh, they, they never bothered me again after that because I feel, you know, I'm validated. But like I said, I understand data confidentiality. I understand that, but not in this regard, not where um, my privacy and my my very basic things like my name isn't protected. So to me, it just balanced out somewhat. Um, I, and, and, and that's that's a standard confidentiality banner. Um, and it protects the offender because it, it protects him from having the public know what he's up to. And I think that's wrong as well. And... Um, you know, I still talk about what I receive in the mail. I haven't had any other inf- or contact from corrections or the full board saying not to speak about it anymore. I think they just generally leave me alone um, just to, to do whatever I do. But it's not just me. I think that other victims of crime are now doing it as well because it's just the balance needs to be back there somewhere that the rights of, uh, you know, anybody who's looking at this can see that the rights of the uh, the, the victims are so much less than the rights of the offenders. So in this day and age of social media, things will get out and people will talk about it. And I think that's, that's great. I think that's what needs to happen because it highlights deficiencies in the system and it highlights how uneven things are for, for people in this system. Have you had any um, feedback from any of your um, political people or people in your area that you're from like uh, are they supportive or do they even talk to you about it or I have um, an MP who is very supportive who lives in the area that I live in and he has I, I remember going to see him in 2012 when all this was unfolding uh, five years early and he was he was again shocked because if you're not in this system you don't know how it works right so he was shocked and he was surprised and um, you know, he has been with me right along the way. His name is Dr. Colin Carey, and he's my local MP. And, um, you know, he, not, not just being a politician, I think he just gets it as, a, as, a, as a, a citizen of this country, that it's wrong. So I have had, um, like, I, I'm a great letter writer, and I've had other politicians not even bother answering um, my letters are, you know, addressing my concerns, but this one um, gentleman has. And recently, in June, in Ottawa, he tabled a bill in Parliament, um, Bill C-466, that is just an amendment to the Corrections and Conditional Release Act to include why an offender is being released at a prison early. That is just a, such a simple ask. Um, but we will see how that unfolds this fall. Like, we have an election here in Canada, so we will see if this bill gets any traction. But it's just such a simple ask and really a no-brainer. Um, but he, he did that, and another MP, um, Lisa Raitt, out, out of Milton, Ontario, um, was there as well for that and backed it. So I do have good people. I always say you need good people around you to support you, and I am very lucky that I do have good people around me. Now, did... Have you had a chance to speak to him, the, the, you know, the criminal himself? It's very interesting that you bring these, you're bringing things up that are actually happening in the here and now in my life with what I'm dealing with. I was in Victoria. I don't know how you're doing that, well, but uh, we, you're, we you really seem to be tuned in. in the government. And... <laughs> you're very, tu- you're very in tune with what I'm dealing with 
like even today, like literally this morning. Um, wow. This man is now, yeah, it, this man is now, um, I, and I use the word incarcerated very lightly. He's now in William Head Institute in Victoria, British Columbia. And mm-hmm. he's been there since 2017. And anyone in Canada, everybody knows, it's, it's called Club Fed, with a good reason, because it looks more like a resort than a jail. Um, inmates live in duplexes uh, with mil- uh, multi-purpose buildings on site with pool tables, um, uh, motivational gardens and stone circles, you know, all these kind of things. He is now currently eligible, and he does uh, have 60 hours a month time to attend AA meetings off-site and walks and talks with a psychiatrist. So mm-hmm. that's where he is now. In March of this year, um, I flew out west to attend a panel hearing um, to get, it was for those walks and talks with the psychiatrist. So it was just to get that approved. And I was able to deliver a victim impact statement. Um, and the, the hearing was about, I'd say it was about an hour and a half long. For the duration of that hearing, including when I delivered my impact statement, this offender sat with his back to me for the entire time. Mm. And I was so offended, um, I was so distressed by it, because to me, that's just a sign of rudeness. You don't sit with your back to people, especially if you're somebody who is, you know, I'm under the guise of rehabilitation, right? He's coming up to full parole. You don't sit with your back to somebody. First of all, it's rude. Um, Secondly, you know, you gauge body language to see if there's remorse or whatever. Um, But I was very offended by that. And after the hearing, I said to the um, regional communication officer, I said, you know what, that's not right. I'm I'm distressed, I'm upset, he sat with his back to me. How can he be held accountable in that moment when his back's to me and I'm speaking to the back of his head? And Mm -hmm. her response to me was, well, that's how most victims of crime want it. And I'm like, well, you know, you have to have room for people like me who need to see accountability in someone. So, yes, I have seen him. I saw him in 2012, and I saw him in 2019, um, just like a few short months ago. And with that whole situation with his back of his head to me, that to me is just, um, again, Correctional Services Canada and the parole board enabling this offender. Like Like, how easy is that to sit there and talk about stuff and not have to look at your your victim's family member. Yeah. I just thought it was a literally free pass for this guy, and um, he was well, not accountable. Yeah, it's arrogant, and he's not showing any sign of um, remorse or recovery. Or, yeah. I'm sorry, I or did nothing. this, and, 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 yeah. I'm, and I'm trying and, to be better and see, I, that. Um, and for me to hold my tongue for 90 minutes is nothing short of, um, it's, it's not easy to do. But you're not allowed to say anything except what you've got written in your impact statement. Because mm-hmm. if you say something, uh, it's like, if I, let's say I just started, you know, you know, excuse me, why is this man with his back to me? Like, you know, don't I deserve a little bit of respect? If I did that, the offender has the right to file an appeal if he didn't get what he was asking for based on my behavior that day. Now, how ludicrous is that? Do you have to keep quiet? Yeah, exactly. So you have to keep quiet. And it was afterwards when I got back to Ontario. Um, again, I was upset right then. And I'm still upset even to this day that that happened because um, it's, it's, it's not just having him be accountable for his actions. Again, Correctional Services Canada and the Pro Board have got to be accountable for theirs because that's the way they do it. And that's not right. Um, and uh, I took the complaint to the uh, chair of the parole board here in Canada, and um, we're trying to sort that out. Um, you know, they, you know, they're trying to uh, reflect exactly what I complained about, and they're on, on draft two of the letter because it's still not right. And uh, you know, it, it's not just an apology, and it's not just a letter that I'm looking for. I'm looking for change, so it doesn't mm-hmm. happen because I'm sure there's other people out there like me who would think that maybe there are people who are fine with that, but there has to be room for people who aren't fine with something like that. Um, and, and there has to be the choice, I think, where you don't have control on so many things 
in like a tragedy or a trauma or a, a murder or a crime of this magnitude. You try to control what you can control. You try to, to limit the unknowns in situations. And, you know, they're like, oh, well, um, you could have applied for a seating arrangement change. And I said, well, you can't apply for something if you don't know it even exists, right? right. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, they need to be accountable for their actions, and they need to be accountable. Uh, Terry Porter, um, again, to me, after all these years, should be turning around and facing his victim's family. Right? To me, that's, again, a no-brainer. And if, and, and if that's the way it's done, ask me if I'm comfortable with that instead of just putting it back to me. And uh, to me, writing that impact statement that I labored over lost a lot of its impact because I'm speaking to the back of somebody's head, right? Um, and, and again, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't have to deal with that. Like it's such a, it's such mm. a hard time to begin with. All these other little extra things that go on shouldn't happen. Because really, nobody needs to go through that. Um, and it's just an uphill battle sometimes making people who are to see things from the non-offender's point of view. And, right. uh, you know, I can, I, I say to people, if I had three lifetimes, I'd never cover as much as uh, I need to with corrections in the full board. Because it's like I turn over a rock and all this other stuff crawls out. And it's like, okay, that needs to be looked at. That needs to be addressed. And here in Canada, we don't have um, we don't have one one dedicated body that's a public advocate for victims of crime. Again, that's not right either. So, you know, you don't have one one place you can go and say this is what's happening. You know, this is my experience. Um, we have the ombudsman's office for victims of crime, but they don't publicly advocate for victims. That instead seems to fall to various uh, individual citizens, like uh, citizen initiatives across this country who individually or by um, bonding with other people in the same kind of situation, it's up to them um, to try to make inroads, to try to draw attention to these huge deficits in our system. Um, and it's, it's to Correctional Services Canada's advantage that we don't have a, a, a body that publicly advocates for us. So, again... <laughs> The offender wins there too, right? Yeah, I have a question uh, about back to uh, him having his back turned to you. Um, right. I believe there's a part a program in Canada where an offender can actually sit down with um, with the victim's family. Is that something that he's ever suggested, or something that um, you would be interested in at all? Okay, again, you're right on cue with what I'm dealing with. Um, <laughs> Which I think is just a little bit, a little bit scary, <laughs> but uh, a welcome question for sure because that's called restorative justice. And after this this hearing in March, where I was so affronted and so offended and and, and just distressed about it, um, I thought, what am I going to do now? I'm running out of time, right? I need to have him to hold him accountable, right? Mm -hmm. And listen, whether he, even if he doesn't listen to me or hear me. Facing me will make me feel better because I know I'm delivering the message in the best way possible. Right. So, um, we have in Canada, uh, highly touted by Correctional Services Canada, restorative justice. And I have trouble with the words restorative and justice being in the same sentence. So I called mm -hmm. them up and said that to them. Um, I said, I'm not interested in forgiveness. I'm not interested in any of that. I was very honest with them. I told them what happened in March. They said, well, we call it um, the Victim Offender Mediation Program. And uh, they said, you can sit down one-on-one -on -one with this person. And I said, well, it, it wouldn't be nice. I said, I'm not there to forgive. I'm, I'm, I, I would be there to say exactly what I need to say and mm. deliver it the way I want to deliver it um, mm. and then just get up and leave, right? Because to me, that, that was an opportunity missed in March. In March. So um, I'm exploring that. I got their um, criteria uh, leaflet online and looked at that. The mm -hmm. criteria is that you live in British Columbia or the Yukon. And I phoned them up and I said, I'm in Ontario. Ha what? Like, is, I, it not like a, what? Is, it, is it not a federal institution? That doesn't make any sense. It is sense. a federal institution with a federal crime. 
Um, yeah. So, again, that's like with the other million things I need to... That's that rock I said, that you turn over and all these other things um, come out. Well, and you can give my address if you want to, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. There you go. <laughs> I'll be your, your house guest for a week or whatever it takes. Yeah, but they whatever can, it we, takes. Can, we can, they said we can try to accommodate, uh, you know, the best the best we can. But to me, the point is, Correctional Services Canada should not be touting this as an, an alternative when it's not applicable to everybody in the country, right? Like that's that's uh, the problem. The, you have to get to the root of the problem in my mind, and that correction shouldn't be putting that out there if it's not applicable and easily accessible by everybody. And, and this mm-hmm. is a big country, however. Um, you know, don't put it out there to other people in other provinces if it's not something that's easily accessible. Um, just the whole, and, and, you know, do I want to sit down with this guy? Not really. But in order to maybe get some satisfaction and undo the, the damage done at that March town hearing, I probably would sit down and say what I need to say and then hopefully just let that part go. Um, but I'm not there yet because it's, everything's developing, like, as we speak. Um, mm-hmm. But that's so many different things. Well, and who's to say? Because maybe, maybe if you sat down, you wouldn't be allowed to say certain things too, right? Who's to say how restricted? Uh, I know. They, they, they're telling me that I can say what I like, but I already, you know, on, you know I already have multiple examples of them telling me one thing yeah. and it, the reality being something different, going right back to 1991 with that certificate of conviction. Exactly. Well, here's what they're here's what they're telling me: life in prison, no parole for 25 years. Surprise! The reality is he's out doing a uh, walk, you know, walking the streets at 21 years. So I used to be naive. I used to think that a well worded and a well delivered impact statement would uh, keep an axe murderer off the streets. I'm not that naive anymore because I've been educated in the reality of what it's like to try to navigate through this system. And I am sure that anybody in my position, um, anybody who's had to try to navigate through corrections and the full board, I'd be surprised if anybody had a shred of confidence left in them because I certainly don't. And I think the majority of people don't either. Do you have a website or anything that people can... uh uh, keep up with you, or like what? Where do you put all your information so people can read it? I put. Um, I have a. Da- I have justice for dad. So justice, uh, the number four dad on Facebook that I started years ago. Um, just it was first of all to keep my my family across the country informed of what was going on because even though I am the the public face of the family, I've got a lot of people you know in my family who support what I do. And, um, you know, not just me, but in my dad's memory as well, right? Um, just to keep things, you know, in the forefront. But over the years, that has grown, which is great, because people are interested. And it's not just other victims of crime, it's the public as well. That um, as these stories get out, as more people break the confidentiality banners, the public is more aware too, and they're offended by it, as yeah. they should be, right? Should because... Be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, and 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 that's what happens, and and I think social media for that is great because it unites people across this country. Um, I, murder is very isolating. When this happened, I was 21. Um, I had to ID my dad in the morgue, right? So that just kind of puts you in a different kind of league of everybody else, all your friendships. You know, if you didn't know me then. You, as the years went by, you didn't know what happened because it's very isolating. And it just came to the point uh, where you just didn't want to talk about it anymore. I said that my older sister had passed away, so that just isolates you even more. And, um, and then, you, you know, fast forward two decades, you have all this coming out from corrections and the parole board. And, you know, and then them naming me at the panel here, and it's just like, it's like, okay, you know what, you make a decision, do you keep quiet like you have, or do you go public, so to speak, and, and, and bring this to the fore? And that's not an easy thing to do, but you do it because, again, that's what propels people because they don't, it's wrong, it's fundamentally wrong um, that all this is happening and that the public really isn't aware of it. 
Um, and that's, and I think that's not just me, but I think it propels a lot of victims of crime that do speak up, just the frustration of dealing with the system. Yeah. Um, and well, at the moment, yep. I was just going to say we are quickly running out of time, and I want to talk, get your book uh, in there. So your book, She Won't Be Silenced, is available at all bookstores and Amazon, of course. And we'll have it right. on our website as well, so people can just do one click and buy it when they're listening to the show. So Fantastic. Uh, well, Lisa, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www houseofmystery.com Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.